The Kermit Mark III is a four-channel compact supermodulator with five modes per channel, freely assignable CV inputs, internal cross-modulation between channels, master tempo control, and of course the Mark III morphing preset manager. Per channel functions consist of free or clock synced wavetable LFOs, audio oscillators, envelope generators, smooth and step random, and sample or track mode. Design full synth voices, clock synced polyrhythmic LFOs, chaotic feedbacking random outputs, morphing wavetable oscillators, stair stepped envelopes, and much more. A micro SD card slot allows for the transfer of custom made wavetables into the module for endless possibilities. All these features combined with preset management make Kermit a truly powerful solution to complex modulation in a small and performance ready package. Let's dive in. Before diving into the functions, let's take a look at the various programming displays. The primary visual state shows an overview of each of the four channels. Channels A and B include a full set of controls with C and D taking a more simplified approach. However, C and D remain fully programmable. The primary display includes the type of generating mode, along with its frequency or division slash multiplication of the main tempo. The secondary display shows the modulation assignments in a matrix for each channel. To access, simply hold the encoder and the display immediately changes. This view includes the CV assignments as well as internal cross-modulation routings. The primary display also includes a master BPM controlled by the tap tempo button or gate input. The master tempo can be divided or multiplied within the global menu. Hold the encoder and press preset to enter the preset menu, then scroll down to set global options. To set the mode and options for each channel, hold the encoder and press the associated channel button. The changes we make regarding mode and frequency are reflected in the information of the primary display. Channels C and D share a button, so channel D's options are accessed by scrolling past channel C. After programming, press any channel button to return to the primary display. Here we have programmed clock synced LFOs. Notice the division or multiplication per channel rather than the actual frequency has appeared. Finally, the remaining displays are small windows that appear when adjusting surface parameters. If we turn a knob like amplitude, there is a bar indicating level. If we change wavetables, we can see the selected wave appear. The windows will disappear automatically, but to exit them immediately, press a channel button. The four outputs are at the bottom, each with an LED to display the signals. To engage presets, press the preset button and choose from the eight different presets with the encoder. To initialize all live parameters, hold the encoder and press the preset button. Then scroll down to Initialize Preset. This applies to the live panel and options when no preset is active. The primary mode of Kermit is LFO. To demonstrate, we will patch channel A to control the cutoff of the bionic Lester. This is a simple sine wave. We can start to adjust its frequency and amplitude right on the surface. Turning the waveform control will begin to morph the LFO into new modulation shapes. We can change wavetable banks by holding the channel button and turning the waveform knob. There are eight total banks, each with eight waves. Let's 
Let's change parameters. Access the channel menu by holding the encoder and pressing the channel button. Under type, select Reset LFO. This LFO will reset its phase if a trigger is received at the volt per octave input. Let's send a few gates from the Stilson hammer. An exciting feature included in all modes is the ability to adjust the wave's phase. Just as we access wave bank selection, we hold the channel button and turn the amplitude to change phase. A convenient visual display appears. In this mode, the phase offset is particularly useful, as that is where our wave starts with each trigger. Since we are on the subject of secondary controls, we can also control fine-tune by holding the channel button and turning the frequency knob. The final LFO type is tap tempo. Here the wave is tempo synced at a multiplication or division of the master tempo. The primary display will include that speed with a number that changes as the frequency controls are adjusted. We can easily hear the synced LFO with a clock source patched and a pitch sequence sent to the oscillator. Again, let's adjust the phase control to create a sharper start. finish, there are a few extra options that apply to every mode. Scrolling down in the channel menu, we first see a voltage range control. We are currently in 12 volt peak to peak, which is good for LFOs and oscillators, but we may also select 0 to 6 volts, which is better for the envelope mode. Finally, there's an additional 1 volt peak to peak option, included for users of video modular synthesizers. In this audio system, we will not be needing that low voltage range. If we scroll all the way down to the bottom of the menu, we can see a character setting. The first setting is no morphing. This will discreetly step through different waves. We also have the option for 12 and 8-bit reduced quality playback. In CV generating modes, this adds a stair-stepping characteristic to the curves and is a nice addition for creative modulation. If 
finally we have depraved, which is an 8-bit wave with no interpolation. Here we are patching up four independent clock sync telephones to various timbre controls in the voice. It is very performative with the four big channel knobs controlling the rhythmic relationship between LFOs. For channels C and D, amplitude is changed by holding the channel A button and turning the respective channel knob. And waves are changed by doing the same but with the channel B button. As we can hear, just changing the four frequencies has a huge impact on the modulation and the perceived groove and clock synced operation. The next mode is oscillator. Audio can be generated from any of the outputs. The range has a limited high frequency, reaching just above 1 kHz. There are lots of timbres to choose from, with the 8 wave banks that include 8 waves each. Some of the more complex harmonic waves will alias at the top end of the frequency spectrum. 
This effect can be utilized as an interesting timbral characteristic. Six and seven are designed more as envelope shapes, but do sound interesting and have a more nasally character. oscillators mixed together.
oscillator can track one volt per octave. Let's patch a sequence. The final oscillator mode is code scan. This derives an audio signal from the program code of the module, which sounds like a very harsh digital noise or pulse wave. The waveform control will move to a new section of the code. This mode naturally sounds great, processed through the bionic luster. One great use for oscillator mode is as an FM source. Here we have a patch to the external FM input on the Hertz donut. All the sound shaping options greatly affect the FM quality, and the built-in attenuator provides a voltage-controlled modded X parameter, great for use with oscillators or filters that lack an FM attenuator. Notice the motion introduced when switching to unison. We can also reduce the quality of the wave to add a more digital character. Let's hear some other waves. It is usually more pleasant to duplicate your CD sequence to the one volt graph that is the modulator for ratio Oh, <laughs> shit.
Kermit is just as capable an audio source as it is a modulator. Don't forget we can also design and load custom wave banks via the SD card, opening up the tambo possibilities even further. A super modulator wouldn't be complete without envelope mode. Here we can fire off single cycle waves with a trigger at the volt per octave input. In envelope mode, it is recommended to use the 0 to 6 volt setting on the voltage range parameter. This ensures a clean fall to 0 volts, rather than a bipolar curve that reaches into negative voltage. Here the Stilson Hammer's gate output is patched to the volt per octave input for triggering the one shot wave. If we bring up amplitude, it will begin to modulate filter cutoff. designed for envelope mode. Notice that the frequency control is backwards in envelope mode. This acts more like a decay control on a typical envelope generator. There is also a handy built-in attack fade that begins around the halfway point of the frequency control. In practice, combined with the morphing waves, there is a nice smoothness to setting up envelopes. That said, we can still turn morphing off and lower the bit depth to introduce stair stepping, like in LFO mode. Now let's return to the standard wave bank and offset phase on the sine wave to start high like more of a decay envelope. Here we have added another envelope on channel B, triggered by another gate sequence from the Stilson Hammer. Wow. <laughs> 
The next type of envelope is gated repeat. Now the one volt per octave will activate a looping envelope each time it receives a gate signal. It will react to pulse width. This mode is great for burst effects and chaotic leaning cross modulation. Here the lighted sliders are creating gate signals that will activate the loop only during those steps. The final envelope type is tempo envelope. Now what is the difference between this and tempo LFO mode? The tempo envelope still allows us to adjust the envelope time. It acts like an internal synced clock patched to trigger the envelope. The envelope time control takes the place of fine tune from the oscillator modes. Just hold the channel button and turn the frequency control to adjust envelope time. The envelope modes open up the possibilities for Kermit greatly. We will explore some patches with them later. The next mode is random, the first type being smooth random. This is like a slewed random voltage that will wobble around and never repeat. In this mode, wave and phase controls are inactive, but frequency and amplitude are still very important. The next type is stepped random, a freely moving discrete random voltage generator with the same reduced control set of just frequency and amplitude. The final type of random is tempo synced. We can either tap the tempo or patch a clock to the master input and divide or multiply with the channel's frequency control. LFO from channel C.
As soon as the channel functions are combined, things start to get out of hand. There are endless ways to layer up the modes and types for interesting musical results. The final mode is sample and hold. The first type is the standard modular sample and hold found on many analog synthesizers. The only active control for this mode is amplitude. First we will create a standard random voltage by sampling noise generated by the Hertz donut. Patch the signal to be sampled into the CV input and a gate signal into the 1 volt per octave input. Of course, the behavior of sample and hold will always be subject to what is being sampled, so various types of noise or waveforms will have a great effect on the output voltages. We can switch over from a clock signal to a gate pattern for an even more jittery effect. Remember, the output voltage will only update once a gate is received. Now let's repatch the clock and sample a saw wave from channel B. This will create more of an arpeggiator or stair-stepped wave. Again, we are switching over to a gate pattern. We can also change the sampled wave to a triangle for a rise and fall effect. Notice the bounce to this patch. It is an interesting feature of the two independent frequencies interacting. The next type option is track and hold. This has the interesting function of passing the voltage present at the CV input during the period of the gate signal. As soon as the gate goes low, the last voltage present will be held until the next gate. Layering random functions can be very interesting. Here we are applying track and hold to channel B's clock synced random voltage. It is let through only during the gates programmed on the Stilson hammer. Again, we can compare sample and hold to track and hold. The difference is obvious when sampling an LFO.
Finally, we have tempo sample and hold. This works like the other tempo modes and syncs up to the master clock with a division and multiplication control. Now we only have to sample a signal. Here we have two clock synced sample and holds occurring, patched to the pitch of both piston Honda oscillators. Like before, layering modulation with Kermit almost always becomes very interesting. For instant eerie sci-fi, make sure to sample rising and falling LFOs to get creepy broken stair-stepping. Those are all the possible signals we can create. Let's look at how they interact. First, let's take a moment to look at the link mode built into channel C and D. On these two channels, we can see one more option after random that says oscillator copy. Below this, we can see the choice of channel A, B, or C and D, which will link the two together. Here we will set it so C controls both C and D. Here, the C and D outputs are patched to two hard panned low pass filters so we can easily hear their interaction. Right now, the LFO from each output is identical, so the sweep sounds mono. Notice the speed of C controls both. The only parameter we can still adjust independently for channel D is phase. Therefore, we can make quadrature LFOs easily. To do so, hold the A and C D buttons and turn the D knob. Immediately, we hear the LFO out of D is starting later, and our filters are sweeping one after the other. We can change waves by holding B and turning the C knob. 
Depending on the phase offset and waveforms, the results can vary widely. Here's a sort of filter panning that sounds like one sweep going right to left. Let's change wave banks for C. Hold the CD and B buttons and turn the C knob. Non-standard waves create some very nice stereo effects. Remember, C and D will always be the same wave when linked. Only the phase can be different. Here we have switched C into envelope mode, still copied to D with the phase offset. Now we can trigger a stereo envelope with the sequence. With shorter envelopes, it can sound like back and forth repeats or even single repeat delays. Of course, quadrature does not have to be two of the same parameter. Here C is patched to cut off, and D is modulating the X wave control of the piston contact. In this example, we will use the link function on the random setting. In this case, we will set up channel C to copy channel A. If we unlink the two piston Honda oscillators, we can patch the C random output to the second volt per octave. Now we can hear that although the channels are linked, they only match in rate and type. They still each have their own random generator. Because the operators of the Hertz donut are locked to mathematical ratios by default, we can patch random to their multiply inputs and step through them, making the random sound quantized. We are monitoring at the aux output with both operators mixed. Let's set up channel B on the Kermit to FM the operators. Let's 
patch channel D's random signal to the pitch of channel B's oscillator. Now let's change D to a tempo envelope for bringing up the Hertz Donuts mod index control on beat. To change the envelope time, we can hold the CD button and turn the D control. Remember, this takes the place of the fine tune parameter when in tempo envelope mode. Finally, we have patched through the bionic luster for some short delays made with the stereo comb filters. It's finally time to dive into that mod matrix shown earlier. As we just saw, Kermit is already very powerful when utilizing the four channels by themselves, but it really begins to shine with external CV and internal cross-modulation. To assign external CV to a parameter, all we have to do is hold the encoder and turn the destination knob. Notice the virtual attenuator window appear on the screen. This lets us attenuate or invert the external voltage. Here we will use the Hertz Donut Mark II as an LFO. Let's unassign the pitch CV by again holding the encoder and turning the amount back to zero. Now let's modulate the wave. The process is the same except we turn the wave knob up this time. Each channel's CV input may be assigned to control frequency, wave, and amplitude, each with their own virtual attenuverter setting. Let's return some of the modulation to frequency. 
Now, assigning CV to channel C and D is a bit different because they only have a single knob each. Frequency is done just like channels A and B, as that is the primary control of the C and D knobs. To assign to amplitude and wave, it is the same procedure as changing them while additionally holding the encoder. So, to assign CV to amplitude, hold the A button and the encoder and turn the C or D knob, and the same for wave but instead with the B button held. This single CV input will control both channels C and D if CV is assigned to any of their parameters. Now we can bring back the mod matrix for a bird's eye view of the assignments we just made. We can see that external CV is assigned to almost everything. Let's get the last one on channel B. Now we can see a little V in each channel's row for frequency, amplitude, and wave, indicating assigned external CV. That's all the primary channel parameters connected to the three assignable CV inputs. To remove modulation assignments quickly per channel, we can go to the channel menus to find three clear options available. Clear CV, clear cross mod, and clear all. Cross mod will remove any internal assignments, but for now let's just hit clear CV. When we return to the mod matrix window, we can see that there is no longer any voltage assigned to channel A. Let's do this for all four channels. We can see there's no longer any modulation assignments. Any of the three main channel parameters may be controlled by any of the other channel's sources, and like CV assignment, each connection runs through a virtual attenuverter. Here we will use channel A as an oscillator and modulate the wave. We could patch it physically, but that would of course use up our jacks. Let's quickly make channel B into an LFO and switch the wave to a triangle as our mod source. To assign internally, all we have to do is hold the button of the modulation channel and turn the destination knob. We will see the familiar attenuverter window pop up, like with external CV. Let's add some LFO to pitch. Now let's use the LFO on channel C to change the frequency of the LFO on channel B, which will indirectly affect the sound we are hearing from channel A. Again, just hold the CD button and turn channel B's frequency knob. Finally, let's use channel D to modulate the wave on B. This is the only one that is different. For D, we hold the CD button and the encoder, then turn the destination knob. Now we have enough internal modulation to where it might get confusing. However, we can always return to the mod matrix window to see what is going where. Let's add external CV to control the frequency of D. Again, hold the encoder and turn the D knob, then patch to the CD jack. Now let's make a synth voice with Kermit. Here a sequence from the Stilson Hammer is patched to control the pitch of an oscillator on channel A. If we turn down the amplitude, we can set up an envelope on channel B to open it like a virtual VCA. The gate of the Stilson Hammer will trigger channel B at the 1V per octave input if we set it to one shot envelope. Remember to change the output to 0 to 6 volts for normal envelope behavior. Then just hold the B button and turn the channel A amplitude knob. Uh, 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 uh.
Now let's make the oscillator type unison and lower the quality to 12 bit. Altering the envelope time manually sounds pleasant. Let's route the LFO on channel C to automatically change that for us. Hold the CD button and turn the B frequency knob. We can route the same LFO from C to the amplitude of A as well. Now to add a bit of variety, let's make D into a tempo random. Then sync the Kermit up with the Stilson Hammer's clock output. Hold the CD button and the encoder and turn the wave knob. Creating a standalone synth voice is one of the many arrangements possible with the assignment of internal modulation on the Kermit. Assigning internal modulation to C and D can be less common as they are usually better as the modulators. However, it can be done with slightly larger button combos. The chart on screen shows all the combinations for assigning internal modulation. Channels C and D have frequency, wave, and amplitude modulation specified by button combination due to only having a single knob each. In all instances of modulating C and D, the one knob will be used to set attenuation for the modulation. Now, after we've created a complex setup, we may want to recall it. Like all Mark III modules, the Kermit can save and recall 8 presets of every parameter position and setting in the module. Hold the encoder and press the Preset Manager button to choose a preset location to save in. Click the encoder to save. Now if we hit initialize and check the mod matrix, all of our settings are gone. If we press the preset button and turn to 8, we can see the preset that we just saved return. Notice the channel lights also glow red to indicate the presets are active. Don't forget there is also a random preset generator built in for computer generated chaos at the touch of a button. At each encoder push on the random option, a new preset will be whipped up, as we can see at the outputs. We can of course check out the matrix to see what's going on after loading up a random preset. To finish up, let's take a look at some patches utilizing the topics covered throughout the video. In this first one, the Kermit is again set up like a standalone synth voice, and sequenced by the Stilson Hammer. The percussion is supplied by our old friend, the Machine Drum.
Here we have added a tempo envelope to modulate the filter, processing an additional piston Honda sequence. This patch utilizes tempo synced LFOs and explores the polyrhythms that they create when modulating parameters around the system.
This patch is based around the Kermit's channels cross-modulating internally and patched out to control the system. As we will hear, extreme cross-modulation can get nicely chaotic and unpredictable. Thank <laughs> you.
start to get presets involved. Here a sequence output from the Stilson hammer is being patched to control the permit's preset selection. If we hold the encoder, we can watch the mod matrix go totally crazy. Time to let the machines take over. Let's engage presets on the Bionic Lester and Hurtstone it as well. Thanks for watching this in-depth demo of the new Kermit Mark III Quad Maserati. Keep an eye out for upcoming new releases from the Mark III series. For more information, visit industrialmusicelectronics.com.